Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Bill Barkovitz um, from PKE 139. Um, on behalf of the PKE Alumni Committee and the Alumni Engagement Committee, I'm pleased to welcome everybody here today to this PKE Faculty Speaker Series. Uh, today, the topic is um, innovation in a time of crisis, a proposed framework for innovation in services. Um, want to give a really quick thank you to the PKE Executive uh, Planning Committee, uh, Alan, Jeanette, and Amy. Also, uh, big thanks to the alumni engagement team as well. Um, we started the PKE uh, you know, Faculty Speaker Series, uh, I want to say a couple of years ago. It was uh, during 20, I guess it might have been, it was 2020, because we were supposed to have an in-person PKE Summit. And unfortunately, COVID uh, put that aside. And so we're still working as a committee towards that end. And we're hoping um, possibly next year that we'll actually have an in-person summit. In the meantime, the, the um, faculty speaker series is a great way for us to stay engaged, you know, learning and also with the PKE community. So really happy that everybody can join us. Um, Real quick, um, if you haven't joined PEP Connect, that's a great way to stay in touch with what's going on, the different um, activities and events that are going on um, at the school and with the uh, business school specifically. So join PEP Connect. Um, also, just wanted to mention, um, we do have a uh, scholarship, a $2,500 scholarship for referrals for PKE students. So, you know, the best way to, to grow our alumni and, and have quality alumni is to refer people that you know and you think would benefit uh, from the program and benefit the program, uh, benefit the school. So there is a scholarship uh, and Pearl Quintana is the one to, to contact for that. Um, also just like to acknowledge um, our executive associates who support the uh, Grad Studio School of Business um, in all their philanthropic, philanthropic efforts. Um, so at this time, I want to introduce Dr. David Smith. He's the Professor of Economics, um, Associate Provost of Online Programs, and Chair of the PKE Faculty Committee. And he's going to introduce uh, Dr. Jim Salas and give us a quick update. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate that. Uh, I want to add my thanks to you, Amy, Alan, and Jeanette for keeping this uh, community vibrant and alive and your ideas and support for the PKE program. Are much appreciated and also want to thank uh, uh, Nicole and Deborah for your support of this event. Um, I, will, I serve as chair of the PKE program committee and work with um, former faculty of yours, those in attendance. I'm sure you'll recognize some of these names. I work with Miriam Lacey, Mark Tribbett, John Scully, Charlie Kearns, Demo Svartia Basis, and uh, Jim Salas. And as I've said before, our goal is to enhance the PKE program so that uh, your degree becomes more valuable over time. Uh, with the uh, uh, changes in the COVID protocols, we're planning an in-person uh, full day retreat in April to get together and talk about ways that we can uh, enhance uh, the PK community, the program. Um, and uh, so we're, we're looking forward to that. In addition, just a, an update from the school, you, I expect you've see, received the communication about us, um, our, our current Dean, uh, Derek Van Rensburg is stepping down at the end of April. And so uh, we are looking for a new Dean to lead uh, the Pepperdine Grad Studio Business School. And I am uh, vice chair of the search committee. So um, certainly PKE uh, graduates uh, make a, um, uh, a fertile uh, 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 ground for potential uh, deans. So if you know someone or if you yourself are interested, I just encourage you to reach out to me uh, directly. Uh, we still have some time before the application period closes, and then we'll endeavor to uh, choose our next uh, Dean uh, for the Pepperdine Grad Studio Business School. I also have the privilege today of uh, uh, introducing my good friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Jim Salas. I had the privilege of, of hiring Jim Salas in 2013 when I was Associate Dean of Academic Affairs. Uh, Jim's uh, research examines the intersection of marketing and the edge of the organization on key outcomes such as brand value, sales effectiveness, and innovation. 
Uh, his work has explored the impact of service strategies among traditional industrial manufacturers. He's been published in some very impressive journals, including the Jur Journal of Services Marketing, the Journal of Business Research, and he, his work does a great job in bringing the theory and application together and being of use to marketing practitioners. Um, he has recently been uh, uh, invited to be a global visiting professor at uh, the business school in Monterey Tech in Mexico. I know Jim to be, um, on a personal note, to be uh, 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 enjoy spending time with his family. He's a father of two. I know he's involved in scouting. Uh, scouting. He's uh, raising his family, just I am. We commiserate over that on many occasions and encourage each other along the way. So, Jim, I'm really looking forward to having to hearing what you have to say today. And with that, I welcome you to take it away. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate that. Um, and you can see we had we all wear our uniforms here at the PKE program. So thanks, Dave, for being consistent with that. And thanks for that nice introduction. It's my privilege to be with you guys today. When I was asked to do this a few months ago, I was excited because uh, this is one of those special programs that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, I have the privilege of seeing some of you in my classroom, and I really enjoy it when our relationship kind of transitions into kind of more of a, of a just a great esteem, great friendships, and I just want to say hello to everybody out there in the virtual space. We're going to be seeing this later. Just uh, know that your thoughts uh, are always, um, our memories are always, always with me. So with that, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about one of my favorite subjects, and that's uh, innovation around this area of services. And I thought it'd be really helpful to look at it through the prism of what we've all experienced in the past couple of years, and that's uh, you know a time of crisis in, in many respects, and we'll talk about that in a second. And um, so with that, my plan is to kind of just uh, present about 15, 20 minutes worth of content. And then what I'd love to do is open this up to a, a Q&A and a conversation. So let, with that, let's get started. And I'm going to share my slides with you just to kind of get us um, going here. And great. Hopefully you all can see that. Yep, looks like you can. Um, so again, kind of a quick uh, agenda. We'll talk a little bit about what do we mean when we're talking about crisis, some of the things happening within our current business climate. I'll also kind of just um, talk a little bit about how most companies approach this idea of innovation. And then how does, how does crisis fit into this discussion? You know, is it something that, um, that's pertinent? Is it something that we can, you know, possibly appropriate when we're talking about business strategy and what we're trying to do for our customers and our clients? And then I'm going to just introduce you to what I think is a very helpful academic framework um, on how to approach innovation, specifically around the area of services or solutions. And I'm going to go through and give you some industry examples of each one of those. And then I'll kind of end with some concluding thoughts. So hopefully this is what you signed up for. And let's just go ahead and begin. So my argument is that we're right now experiencing what I'm calling kind of a, a time of crisis. So as we talk about this, you know, if any of you were in my doctoral classes, you know that I'm really big about let's define our terms. What do we mean when we say crisis? So, you know, being the nerd that I am, I go to my good old Webster's dictionary, and Webster defines crisis as any event or period that will lead or may lead to an unstable and dangerous situation that can affect either, either an individual, a group, or even all of society, right? Now, that's certainly, I think, a, a, a very grounded definition. And we think about crisis, most of us think about it through this lens. But if we go a little further, and if we go to some of the literature in, in crisis management or crisis specifically, we can see that when we talk about crisis, we like to think of these comprising of several distinct defining characteristics. So the biggest thing when it comes to crisis is the idea that they're not planned. They're a surprise. They take us off guard, they're unexpected, it's something we haven't solved for. Um, we also think of this as something that is creates a certain degree of uncertainty. Maybe we're not sure how to respond, we haven't been through this before. Um, just think back a couple of years ago when the pandemic was initiating, kind of kind of starting. I think a lot of us were going back to, gosh, when in history did we have something similar back in the 19-teens when it came to the influenza epidemic? Is that the right model? Perhaps it's something different. And then finally, there's this third element, which is that crisis is a threat. It's a threat to what we're trying to accomplish, either as an organization, as a firm, as, as, as a society in, in general. 
But these are kind of the three shared attributes when we talk about what, what exactly is a crisis and how do we think about it. And there's a great quote that I came across from JFK. This is something he shared when he was given the convocation of the United Negro College Fund back in 1959 when he was a candidate. Um, he says, crisis is when written in Chinese, the word crisis is composed of two characters. One represents danger, what we're talking about a minute ago, and the other one represents opportunity. And the danger signs are all around us. So again, I'm not sure how accurate he was with whether the Chinese word does, does mean th those two things, but if we just take them at, at, at face value, this idea that with every crisis, there's not only this danger element, but potentially an opportunity that we can possibly all take advantage of. You know, there was a very famous quote back, um, um, I think it was Rahm Emanuel, the chief of staff to President Clinton says that, you know, um, crisis is a terrible thing to waste. The idea is that it can become kind of the right uh, context for us to kind of go and try some bold new ideas. So this is kind of the context that we're talking about. So, so crisis, what are we talking about? Well, we could be talking about a, a variety of things. A current pandemic, which all have been experiencing and hopefully we're at the tail end of that experience. We could be talking about what's happening in a geopolitical standpoint, what's going on in the Ukraine, this Russian conflict that's certainly causing a lot of anxiety for some of us. We're thinking about what does this do to the price of gas? If any of you here in Los Angeles, you know what that's like. I think I was going to take out a loan to fill up my, my, my car gas tank a few days ago. Um, we also can think about crisis as, is this about uh, climate change? You know, what do we do with uh, the weather's possibly changing? Here in Southern California, especially, you know, fires are a real big thing when we get those Santa Ana winds coming through the fall. Or from a personal standpoint, crisis to me might mean what's going on with MLB, this whole lockout with baseball. What's going to happen with my Dodgers this year, you know? Uh, so again, crisis can mean a variety of different things depending upon your context and your point of view. So as we're getting into this area about innovation and specifically service innovation, I think it's also helpful to pause and ask, well, what do we mean by innovation? Again, let's define our terms. And there's actually a whole literature on innovation, and I don't want to make this discussion about that. I, I will tell you that it's really interesting. I got a chance to geek out a few hours um, this week in this literature. And there was a definition that I came across that I like, and I think it's going to be pertinent to our discussion. So let me share it with you. It's that innovation is the multi-stage process whereby organizations transform ideas into new improved products, services, or processes in order to advance, compete, and differentiate themselves successfully in the marketplace. What I like about this definition is I think it's very practical, right? This is this idea that how do you take innovative ideas and turn them into something new, something of value for your customers that creates differentiation in the marketplace, right? These become points of differences in our value proposition. So now that I've kind of set the groundwork, I hope, in terms of what do we mean when we talk about crisis and what do we mean when we talk about innovation, Let's just kind of jump into this and explore an academic framework, which can also help us analyze this current, um, this current dilemma. So service innovation, in the literature, there's a great framework that I came across a while ago um, when I was in my PhD studies. And that's this, uh, their definition for this paper was that a new service experience or service solution consists of one of these six different dimensions. And these are all different ways in which firms can try to create something new and innovate in this area of services. So one of the things that most companies can do is to create a, what we call a new service concept. And I'll give you an example of what that is in just a minute. Or we can also innovate and from the basis of maybe creating a new customer interaction. You know, how do we interact with our customers? Or maybe we want to choose some type of network or partners and create a whole new value system by partnering with maybe different suppliers. Uh, it might even be a competitor, right? And do this idea of coopetition, right? We can also innovate when we try to create a new revenue model. How do we create new revenue, new lines of business for the organization? Or we can innovate around how do we redesign our organization and create a whole new set of service delivery systems? How do we provide these tangible benefits to our customers? And perhaps there's things we re readjust or shuffle from our organizational design standpoint. 
And then finally, and I think most of us are kind of used to this one, is this, how do we leverage new technology when it comes to delivering new services and solutions, a whole new system, a whole new method of, of going ahead and delivering value to our customers. So what I wanna do now is just walk you through each six of these and just talk about some examples that I've seen of companies innovate around these different dimensions. And we'll certainly open up for some, for some questions and hopefully begin a, a dialogue. So if we start with this idea of a new service concept, one of the things that I saw recently I thought was really interesting is to see how hotels responded to the pandemic. So hotels are usually a place for overnight accommodations. Maybe it's a place to kind of relax. Uh, I know my, my good friend and colleague, Dave Smith, just happened to return from a family vacation in Hawaii. I'm sure he can tell you all about the wonderful amenities he enjoyed while he was there with his family. But what I thought was interesting is that in this pandemic, hotels were completely reimagining what they thought of as full service, where in the past, full service may have comprised of, you know, maybe providing uh, food services or spa services. Well, now because of the pandemic, and they knew that many of us who had a chance and opportunity to travel during this period, we had extra hoops to go through, right? Extra things we had to do. And one of them was testing. So what was really neat to see is uh, Marriott and a few other hotel chains were incorporating this idea of let's go ahead and bring in not just our normal amenities, but let's offer uh, COVID testing for our guests. So that way they can come and be rest assured. They don't have to worry about finding a facility or getting whatever certifications or requirements they need to go back to their home country. So they actually partner with a variety of different labs and testing centers. And they actually included not just whatever rapid antigen test you may have needed, but they also were putting guest minds at ease that if for some reason you tested positive, this could also be the place where you can quarantine. And they were offering additional services, having meals directly delivered to your room, running errands for you. Uh, the idea is that you can come stay for a few days with your family, and you don't have to worry about any of these potential things that might, give, uh, that might interfere with what normally should be a relaxing and great vacation. So again, it's you're combining different services, different products in a new way that creates enhanced value to the organization, but more specifically to your guests, or in this case, your, um, your customers who are, who are staying with you. Um, as a matter of fact, they were combining these expanded solution sets also with some really great financial incentives. So for example, for if you had a quarantine, I can tell you Marriott specifically was offering like 50% off on their, on their stays, if you had to stay there for an extra week or so to, to fulfill the requirements of whatever local government or municipality have in, in the time of, time of COVID. Another one I wanna share with you is this idea of innovating around what we call a new customer interaction. So, and a lot of you, I think have experienced this. It's kind of a whole new world when you go out and, and, and you're dining. The idea that a lot of restaurants turn to the digital menu and um, at first I rejected this. I kind of wanted my old traditional menu, but what I thought it was kind of a, it's a neat opportunity for restaurants. And if you think about this, when you have a customer scan a QR code and pull up your menu, um, what a great way for you to now, now you have a different platform to interact with your customer. Where in the past it was, you know, if you're physically there ordering something from, from the server, now your interaction with your customers is in a digital format. So you can now maybe push messages out to them. You can encourage them to sign up for maybe a loyalty program that you might have. And even though the original seed for this was trying to comply with maybe CDC or local health guidelines in terms of limiting the amount of things that we physically touch, I've seen a lot of restaurants turn this into a whole new way of engaging customers, learning from them, um, observing their behavior, what are they buying, what's more popular, where do they spend the most time in their, in their apps, especially those restaurants that kind of launch their menus as an app. They're doing this very, very effectively. So the idea is that through interacting with your customers through digital, it just really expands the capability and the degree of value or amount of value you can create for your customers. Just a really fascinating, interesting platform. And it's not just restaurants, but a whole host of other industries have gone to this digital interface. And we'll talk about a few more examples in just a minute. 
Um, by the way, if anybody has a question in the chat or whatnot, please uh, please let me know as I'm kind of, I can't see, see it very, very well. Um, and the third one I want to review again is this idea of how do you create a new value system or work with a new set of business partners? And I think it's something we're probably all familiar with is when you've probably seen restaurants and rideshare companies get together, right? Whether it's Uber Eats or DoorDash or whatever you might have what, where you currently live. And it's pretty simple, right? They partner together. They're out there, you know, picking up the food, delivering it to your home. One of the things that I thought was really interesting is to see this happen with nonprofits, ride shares and nonprofits. And United Way in particular teamed up with DoorDash. As you can imagine, during this, this pandemic area, although all of us were affected by this, the reality is that those of us, at, uh, those who are at the very bottom of the economic ladder, really suffered the most. Right, a lot of them were laid off, lost their jobs. Many of many of them were in the service industries. Um, so without customer interactions, you didn't have a need for those for those resources. So what DoorDash was able to do was partner with United Way and deliver services to uh, to families that needed that, that needed these uh, these um, these enhanced benefits. So whether it was doing food delivery, they're helping them picking people up, going to medical appointments. This was in um, a partnership they had that was kind of already, uh, United already had a, a Ride United program. And this was kind of an, an extra extension of that by working with ride shares. So whether it was picking up food, uh, going to doctor's appointments, dropping off maybe uh, different types of, uh, of, of things that were donated through the United Way. It was just a great way to make sure that those who really needed services um, um, and especially in, in, in a trying time like this, still had access to those benefits that organizations like United Way and many others were able to do. So again, uh, whether it's restaurants in the pro for-profit world or nonprofit, how do you work with existing supply chain partners, vendors to create new value for your customers? Interesting bit of data, you know, um, Technomics did some, some research for Uber and they concluded that on a survey they did with restaurant operators, 82% of them were saying that this rideshare partnership was critical to them staying in business. And it was uh, allowed them to stay open, to keep people employed. And um, what we're also seeing, I know I'm guilty of this as well, many of us who had to try this new experience for the first time, we've now replaced it and it's become part of our normal evening dinner experience. I'm, I'm ordering Uber Eats at least, hate to say this, once a week, if not, if not twice. It's kind of easy to get, to get kind of stuck, um, uh, hooked on this amazing, amazing feature. Uh, another way is through new revenue models. So for this, and this is a fascinating company, and I'm sorry, I can't pronounce this Swedish uh, name, but it's Svenska Kaluga Fabriken. What it means, it's Swiss for a Swiss ball bearing factory is what the name translates into. And the crisis that this company went through was back in the 1990s. They were seeing some really um, increased competition, specifically from Japan. And uh, the reality is, is that when you're in the ball bearings business, just think about that for a second. How, how boring is that, right? It's not a very sexy business to be in, right? You're making ball bearings. What's the big differentiator there? So, you know, as you can imagine, like any, everything else, if you can go and make your products cheaper, a lot of these companies did, and they were just killing SKF from a price com uh, comparison standpoint. So Japan really was bringing a lot of competition to bear to this uh, Swedish company. They're based actually in uh, Gothenburg, Sweden, wonderful city. Um, and they started back in 1907. It was originally a family owned business. So in the 90s, they were hitting this competition with firms from Asia, and they were trying really hard to, how do they differentiate themselves in the world of ball bearings? Well, one day they decided that, well, what business are we really in? Are we in the business of making ball bearings or something else? And what they realized is that their products, ball bearings, are used in machines that make other things. So when they stopped looking at their products or what they provide their customers as just this piece of metal wrapped around with, with grease um, and looked at their product as, well, what we really do is we help machines run. So they reconceptualize their value proposition to, we provide machine uptime. We don't sell you ball bearings, we sell you machine uptime. 
And what were they able to come up with was a whole new revenue model where they were creating value by providing services to their clients, where in the past, again, they might sell a ball bearing for what, five, $10 a unit. Now by charging customers as a percentage of machine uptime. So we're going to charge you X dollars for 99.99% machine uptime. Because as those manufacturers, I know we have a couple of them here on the call today, will tell you is that every hour that machine of yours is not running, that's costing you money. So by SKF, basically melding their value proposition to how their clients in turn make money for make money for themselves, that's a whole new way of conceptualizing their value proposition. Again, they went from stop selling ball bearings to selling machine uptime. And that was able to give them a whole new revenue model. And they were also able to provide um, enhanced benefits like sensors and their ball bearings. So they would measure heat vibration. And they were even able to offer services like predictive analytics, predictive maintenance. So based on their sensors, they can tell you that this machine is going to fail, not just that it's going to fail, but when it's going to fail. So you can go ahead and schedule maintenance. Imagine someone goes to your shop and says, hey, I need to take down this machine for an hour to replace a part because it's going to break in two weeks. And being able to do it when it's more advantageous to you as a firm and keep those cycles and those machine cycles up and running. So again, great company, great, great case. Um, really interesting. The fifth way that companies can innovate is by creating a new delivery system. And by this, what we mean is that you take advantage of either key talent personnel that you have, perhaps it's something within your organization or a set of values or culture in your organization. One of my favorite examples of this is the home fitness industry. Um, home fitness, you have a variety of professionals all over the world who are fitness gurus, nutrition gurus. And during the pandemic, people weren't coming together anymore. So they had to take advantage, okay, what, how can we continue to add value to our customers? Well, the reality is they all had laptops, they all had internet connections, and they were able to utilize those technology platforms and create a whole new type of home fitness regime. And they were able to get their clients to use things they had at home, whether it was a chair, whether it was you know, a, a towel or whatnot. And you should Google some of these really interesting, the things that they do to make up for gym equipment, for example, things you have around the house that you can use to help you get into shape and, and, and really kind of uh, move forward in your fitness. The other example is ghost kitchens or ghost restaurants. So a normal restaurant, you can see that a small percentage of the total retail space is actually dedicated to the kitchen. Well, during the pandemic, you weren't able to use the dining facilities anymore, but you still had these kitchens. So we had these proliferation of restaurants that would pop up that didn't have a physical presence. They would go rent the kitchen of established restaurants, go in there for a few hours and make all these meals and then partner with rideshare companies to have them delivered to a wide variety of customers in a certain geographical location. Um, Manhattan specifically, this concept really took off there and there are some really great um, a ghost kitchen brands like Rival Sandwich Company or Stonebridge Pizza that you can't go there physically to visit these, these places. You only can have them delivered to your home because they don't really own any physical facilities. They rent capacity from, from spare capacity from kitchens around the areas that they're serving. So again, this is where you take advantage of whether it's you know your personnel, whether you're a chef or the ghost kitchens or you're a home fitness uh, guru and put them together in a new way of delivering service or delivering value. And the last one I wanna review for you is um, innovation around a new delivery system using technology. And there was a whole host of examples I could have shared with you. This was one of my favorite. Um, as somebody who had two days to shift in the early days of pandemic to an online modality, I can appreciate this, this conundrum. So there's a company, Club Vino, where they had a very successful wine tasting business. They would go and, and host these wine tasting parties. They would show up, bring you a host of, of wines to try with a sommelier, walk you through, you know, just you know, how you should be enjoying your wine, what kind of wine you might like or whatnot. And during the pandemic, obviously, they couldn't do their traditional model anymore. So what they had to do was to turn and use technology. So they created what they call kind of this virtual wine tasting. So you would go online, answer a couple of questions, 
And then they would ship bottles of wine to you with a whole methodology about how you should open your bottles, how you should pour them, how you should taste them, and then set up a Zoom call similar to this, where you get to talk about wine, enjoy wine, and all of you had the same bottle, so you're kind of showing, sharing the same experiences. And what they concluded is that this was a whole new business for them, that they were able to reach customers that they weren't reach them, reaching before with their in uh, or on ground delivery system. And by doing it virtually, they literally were able to expand their potential market to potentially globally. And it's been really, really successful for them, helping customers match wine to food. God knows I need help with that. Um, but, but doing this in a way that's even easier for your customer to, to approach. Some of us can be a little bit overwhelmed and intimidated by, by wine. So doing this in the comfort of your own home, using the technology to kind of make you feel safe, to ask maybe you might be deemed to be an embarrassing question. This was just a great way Club Vino was able to use technology to reach not just their existing clientele, but expand into a whole new market area and still deliver a compelling value proposition. So just to summarize, and I hope we, uh, we, have, um, we have some questions here. Um, again, if you think about crisis as opportunity, right? What can you do? What are new ways you can potentially rearrange of host of factors, walking through that conceptual framework on service innovation, whether you're taking advantage of a new customer interaction, a new, uh, your, your new partners, maybe technology, a new revenue model, whatever that might be. And I'm hoping that those examples I shared with you are just kind of a, a small taste of what your company can do. And with that, I'm gonna stop uh, my slide share and open it up to any questions. Yeah, so, um, so Rob's asking about um, um, streaming concerts during lockdown. So yeah, that's actually a really fascinating new, um, um, new type of solution. And actually, Rob, to, to even counter that, I don't know if you've seen a lot of work um, with Meta, but now they're talking about creating virtual concert experience, not just you at home zooming in, but literally your avatar attending an avatar rock concert that's delivered by uh, virtual uh, characters. Um, it's really fascinating. I personally have some you know, suspicions about, skepticism about that, uh, but it's just the idea of just you know, being here on your couch with your favorite you know, concert t-shirt on, you know, rock on, yelling and screaming. I think my neighbors might wonder what's happening to my home that particular evening. But, but to your point, I think it also is an opportunity for some of us who may not like the, the hassle, those of us who live in LA to drive all the way down to, whether it's the Forum or, or the Greek Theater or whatnot, dealing with traffic and then parking. Have any of you been to the new, um, the new stadium in Inglewood? In um, it certainly is an interesting kind of way, right? Of kind of reimagining the value proposition so you can still en enjoy these particular experiences but maybe in a whole new way, because there's also benefits to that as well. You know, you get comfort of your seat, you get, you get, a, you get a front row seat, right? You're not kind of way in the back with, with binoculars or whatnot. So yeah, that's a fascinating, uh, fascinating example. I haven't yet, uh, uh, Dr. Siles, I haven't yet uh, uh, checked out any of the meta shows. I, I think what early reports think it's still a little buggy. I think it, it's, it, it's not flawless yet, uh, but I think definitely has a lot of promise. Uh, I will say one thing related in the entertainment space. I mean, I completely changed my taste as far as motion pictures, obviously with the number, with either uh, theatrical, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, the synchronized the theatrical with streaming uh, releases or sometimes there, there's a staggered release as well. I got so accustomed to watching theatrical movies via streaming and other things that it's still a novelty when I think of a film, I still think like, hey, is that movie streaming? Oh, it's theatrical only. Ah, oh, darn it. You know, I just, I, I totally switched the way, the mode in which I'm, you know, <clears throat> as I'm sure a lot of other people did as well, to where now the theatrical almost became not, a, not an unknown or a novel thing, but just like uh, uh, it, it was no longer the de facto go-to. The streaming mode was the one that I was looking for. You know, Rob, not even that, but think about this, especially those of us who saw a lot of entertainment through our streaming platforms. I think it also allows entertainment companies and studios specifically to tap into a whole new potential audience. 
So for example, I found myself watching TV shows, mm -hmm. documentaries and movies that I wouldn't normally go watch in the theater. Part of it is because maybe I'm embarrassed to, to admit that I'm watching, you know, some documentary on some weird topic or whatnot, or for example, Octopus uh, Teacher. I never would have paid money to go see that in, in a movie theater. It actually was a really great documentary. <laughs> I really, really enjoyed it. So I think to your point, you know, not only is it allow you to reach your existing audience base within the world of entertainment, but I think these new technologies and new ways of experiencing them or reaching your audience can open up new segments where in the past, maybe you weren't tapping into. Thank you, Dr. Fowler. Interesting. I'm watching, I'm reading Vanessa's comment here. Um, so I'm really sorry, Vanessa, you had a lackluster experience, it looks like. Um, I think, you know, in, in, in defense of the, of, the, um, of the hotels, I don't know which hotel you're, you're, you're using, obviously, but this is kind of a new space for them, right? Trying to add these additional services, additional experiences to make your stay as pleasant as possible. I know we had a chance to go to, to, to Cancun during the pandemic, and it was a big um, contention, this idea, like, should we not go? What's going to happen? Are we able to come back? Mm -hmm. And that was a really big consideration for us about whether the go or no-go decision. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was listening to you. I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with what you're saying. Um, yeah, it was lackluster for a few reasons, and I think they might be missing some opportunities to maybe bring in some traffic, but for the most part, like you don't get room service unless you request it. I mean, room cleaning unless you request it. Um, uh, you basically carry your own things unless unless you really flag down somebody. Nobody wants to touch your belongings. Um, it, it's just, and then like the, the amenities, you know, where you really, are, I'm paying for extra. Let me get free breakfast or let me go to the pool. And just, well, those things are closed and uh, the breakfast is a buffet now. Walk through at your own risk. So it's it's different. And I think there's maybe missing some innovation opportunities. Maybe they should deliver, you know, continental breakfast to the to the room or, you know, offer um, on call bell service, something, something. I just think maybe it's being yeah. overlooked. Yeah, Vanessa, what I would say is that remember the competitive framing here, though, right? Because when we're in the heart of the pandemic, the question wasn't, does this hotel have, you know, room service, all these other things available to you. The question was, is the hotel open? Because mm -hmm. remember, in the heart of this, it was like, literally, you're open or you're closed. So what they were trying to do was, okay, how do I provide the minimum core benefit, right? Which is like an overnight stay somewhere that's safe and clean. Mm -hmm. And if I can do that and still adhere to certain health regulations, because I can tell you, talking to my students in the, in the hospitality space, they hated not being able to take your luggage to your room or be able to offer room service. A lot of hotels differentiate themselves on that level of service. If you're going to the Beverly Hills Hotel or any kind of hotel that, that stature, that's their thing is the staff and how they treat you like royalty, whether you're this boring professor or a rock star. Um, it's just an amazing experience. And to not be able to do that. And what I found interesting was even those brands the creativity in which they still try to offer that kind of what I call special touch, that white glove service, I thought was really interesting. I don't know if you had a chance to experience some of those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. I mean, it, I mean, it was, you know, I would say a five star, I would say, but uh, I, I see what you mean by just uh, actually giving the core um, service that they're, they're known for. So I'll keep an eye out, maybe write some reviews. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Vanessa. I appreciate Thanks, that. Ben. Chris, I just saw your comment here about uh, depending on the segments here. You're right. You know, um, I didn't travel obviously a lot um, internationally, but um, so my students who, who who did, they noticed a real big difference in in how um, some of these, especially um, uh, travel companies or, or, or in hospitality space, kind of responded to 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 a crisis like like a pandemic. I think it was very very different, and, and in a way that kind of makes sense, right, Chris? Because Every country had a different level of, of, of infection rates and whatnot, right? All of us were kind of experiencing it. Some of us had vaccination rates, some of us not, not so much. Um, some countries chose to kind of let COVID take its course and you know, solve for natural immunity or, or herd immunity or whatnot. But, um, but yeah, and, and I think that makes sense, right? That, that brands and companies are going to 
you know, respond uh, as a function of their competitive frame. Again, you know, what, what's available in their, in, in their home market, what is the competing brand offering and how can they still try to deliver on their value proposition? What I hope this conversation allows you to explore a little bit is just ways of not just, you know, thinking about how do you provide your same standard of services, but now that you have your customers being forced to reconsider how they interact with you, how they conceive and conceptualize your value proposition, is there something else you can do now? So whether you're that restaurant going to digital menus, what does that allow you to do? Now that you have a digital interaction, a digital platform where you didn't have one before, how can you create a compelling value proposition now? I think that's the challenge for all of us, right? Is how do we come up with something to take advantage of current uh, current conditions? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And a few other oh, things that I... Thing. Oh, Michael. Sorry, Christopher, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just adding on to what you had said that I found a lot of different um, strategic partnerships as well as horizontal vertical alliances that have been happening in each one of those segments. And you talked about the theatrical, the streaming, um, and a lot of pieces that the entertainment industry has reached out into the hospitality industry. I think everybody appreciates the amount of wine and other spirits that were drank during that time period and expand upon, <laughs> just saying. And uh, I, I just think it's it's very interesting. And I just got a phone call with a private equity firm that was specifically talking about um, these vertical and horizontal alliances and growth strategies on that. And it was really funny that it ha that conversation happened 45 minutes before this call. So. <laughs> That's great. I'm glad to hear that, Christopher, that, that these are, we're seeing companies, again, take advantage of this window of opportunity, because I do think, well, depends what happens, right, with the, with the conflict in, in Ukraine, but this window could be closing, you know, in terms of the, what we, we call crisis. So, so again, to whatever degree, you can kind of just reconceptualize some of this, I think would be really interesting for, your, for you or any other company to consider. Uh, Glory, I'm sorry, did you have a comment? Okay, I think Gloria, Gloria may have less stuff. Martha, you had a great comment in here about using um, um, autom excuse me, robots and robotics in, in general. Um, I love what Japan is doing in this, in this area. Um, you mentioned um, delivering food services and whatnot. I don't know if you've seen, my favorite one is the robots that, that hug you. Um, there's a big issue in Japan where you have rural villages that are losing their young people. There are villages in Japan that have nobody under the age of 40 that live there. So you have um, uh, just people, very, very older, um, all the young people go into the cities for jobs and careers. And you have a lot of single person households that they don't interact with anybody. And there's a big uh, issue and crisis around loneliness. People are just very, very lonely. Um, so somebody invented this robot that actually will talk to you, interact with you. But uh, the amazing feature I thought was it'll give you a hug. What the, some of the researchers there have found is that what people miss is some of that tactile, you know, the, the, the hugs and, and the handshakes and arms on shoulders and whatnot, those basic kind of human interactions. For those of us, you know, been through, through COVID the last couple of years, um, I can attest to, I'm a big hugger, uh, Dave knows that, and it's been hard to kind of resist that urge. So Martha, to your point, using a robotic technology to do some of this, again, and you mentioned some great examples in here in the, in the chat about uh, some of the, the cruise lines uh, using technology to, to accomplish some of this. I guess the question I have for you, Martha, is do you think Princess and these companies are going to keep these new innovations in place? Do they view it as not just a stopgap, but a way to create and continue to add value? I'm curious. Yeah, sure. Um, just to build some context. I mean, you know, my background, I spent 12 years of Viking Cruises and six years of Princess. Um, and I would say the initiative started pre-COVID and more specifically with Princess, they were the only one that really started to think of these innovative ideas on how to enhance um, customer service. And it was really because of competitive pressures. But I think post-COVID or during COVID, the other cruise lines really started to see the value. And anytime you 
you launch some kind of innovative technological project, um, it, it, it costs a lot of money, it takes a lot of resources, and that has, that has been the barrier. And it's not only hospitality, a lot of companies, right, um, just didn't want to go into that path. And so I think what COVID has done is it has removed the, um, the possibility of risk taking. Um, and then and then moving forward with these innovative projects. And so the answer to your question, I think that they're gonna move ahead with it. Um, I think it was something that was needed and COVID just kind of pushed them to the edge to have to do it. And I think that consumers have been asking for it. I mean, the comment earlier of why, why am I not being taken care of? And so in hospitality, that's a constant question. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, you're going to start to see more and more of it. Um, just having the experience, it takes a long time, several years to start building these process and processes and implementing them. So I guarantee you in probably the next two, three years, you're going to start to see cruise lines and hotels, even airlines launching these new innovative uh, projects. Yeah, Martha, that's a really good point. You know, what, what I love about the example you used is the idea of using your phone for mobile payment, whether you're on, on the ship. Um, what I was, I was thinking about is also imagine that platform now that, that a cruise company like Viking or Princess now has, they can use geolocation now. So not only can they enable, you know, point of sales transactions, but they can also, if you allow them to, track you, where are you on the ship? And there's a congregation of, of people in certain parts of the ship. Maybe you direct service resources there, right? Um, and you can also use it when you're doing onshore excursions. You know, where are the most popular places your customers like to go to buy buy things or experience things? Now you have data you can go back and maybe negotiate, right? Special features, special things for for your um, for your guest. So I, I, again, just you can just go crazy envisioning different ways of restructuring different ecosystems, platforms, technology to enhance not just the experience for, for your visitors, but literally the whole value proposition of why they choose a Viking versus a competing brand. It's because of this holistic experience that they bring, not just when you're on the ship, but from when you're excursion, ship time, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Any other questions, comments? Innovation is a really great, great topic. I, I love talking about it. Um, it's really interesting as I, as I work with some of you in, in the classroom and I learn more about your businesses and your industry. I'm always amazed at just the new um, uh, nuances and new trials, the hypothesis testing you all do within your different markets. Or, or sometimes I like to challenge you, you know, about, you know, wh why aren't you reconceptualizing your value proposition? You know, don't rest on last year's success it's going to bring in next year's results you're looking for so again it's just a just a fun topic for me and um, looking forward to hopefully seeing some of you guys in a future classroom thanks Jim. so if that was, that was fantastic yeah go ahead bill I was Thank just you. Gonna say, that was, it was really great, great. Uh, I wish I had you during my PKE uh, time. <laughs> <laughs> really, really great time. I appreciate it. Um, I guess if there's no other questions, we'll we'll end it a little early. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.